I'd like to begin with an apology. I uh, broke a cardinal rule. I did not bring enough for the entire class. <laughs> hmm. Picture this. You're sitting in a dimly lit booth surrounded by friends and family or maybe that special someone, and uh, you just enjoyed the greatest Reuben you've ever had in your life. You're washing it down with one of the world's best beers, and you're telling stories, and you're laughing, and every dollar you spent went towards a cause that you feel passionate about. My name is Ryan Sari, and this is the story of the Oregon Public House. In uh, 2009, uh, my family and I moved back to Portland, and a few things happen when you move to Portland. Uh, one, you get a tattoo. Uh, <laughs> It's like a passport stamp, you know? It's like, ah, oh, I see you've been to Portland. Uh, second, uh, your taste in coffee and beer get very expensive uh, or ironic. You have a choice. Uh, and three, you start a nonprofit. Everybody does it. Uh, the primary reason that I moved back to Portland was to start a faith community. My actual job is a pastor. Um, and, uh, you know, I love the church. I love our church. I believe at its best, the church can be a place of community and of growth and of healing and of unconditional love. Um, but at its worst, I believe that the church or religion um, can be extremely divisive and perhaps even hurtful. Um, it can, uh, in my opinion, uh, oftentimes erect unnecessary walls that actually um, uh, divide community as opposed to establish it. So I had this dream and I had this hope of starting up uh, an organization that gave back and cared for our city in some way, um, but didn't have all that baggage of religion attached to it, right? Something that where we could partner with everyone in the community, regardless of background or, or anything, um, to give back and care for our city. And I was sitting in my backyard with some friends, and we were talking about doing just that, starting up a public benefit nonprofit. And uh, doing a quick survey, we realized that Portland just didn't need any more nonprofits, right? <laughs> There's plenty of tattooed, beer drinking people out there doing great things already. So, uh, so what, why would we start another? In fact, I heard that Portland has more nonprofits per capita than any other city in America. I love that, right? I love that. So why would we start another? So then we thought, well, what if we could start an organization that kind of partnered with those existing nonprofits and came alongside and supported them in some way? Um, and then we had to figure out what kind of way we could do that. At this time, the recession was coming on strong, and nonprofits were floundering, and their biggest need for support was money, right? Uh, and so we thought, well, maybe we could help with that. The average nonprofit, a huge part of their energy, time, um, and involvement is fundraising a lot of the time, right? I read a study recently that estimated that over one-third of every donation received from the average nonprofit has to go immediately back into the fundraising department. And so we thought, well, what if there was an organization that did that for them? What if there was actually a business that did that for them? So the charity focuses on changing the world, and we focus on raising money and awareness for them in a sustainable and reproducible way simply by running a successful business. This was the idea. So then we started thinking, okay, what kind of business could we start, right? Coffee shops, concert venues. We're sitting in my backyard, and I was drinking uh, an expensive beer non-ironically, and I was thinking, and I thought, well, what about a pub? You see, Portland, in addition to being number one in nonprofits, we also have more breweries than any other city in the world. I love that, too. So why not combine these two great attributes that kind of define our city, right? This is truly part of the pulse of Portland beer and nonprofits, right? I've said many times, I think if the city of Portland like created life, if they had a baby, if the city had a baby, it would be a nonprofit pub. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, it would just, that's what it, it would also wear skinny jeans and listen to Lionel Richie, ironically. Um, <laughs> but why not do something and, and, and kind of embrace the power 
of the pint. So I did what uh, all of you would do. I went immediately to the local library and I checked out the book, uh, How to Start a Small Business for Dummies. Uh, it's a grad level textbook. And uh, th this is the problem. See, we had this idea that we thought was good, maybe even great, but we had no clue how to make it happen. I'm not a business person, I don't know anything about that. Um, so I just kind of started sharing this with everybody that I met. And all of a sudden, we had this team, this core group of people that were willing to lend a hand and come alongside and see this thing actually happen. And in August of 2010, we got a building. And it was like, like, oh, now it has to happen, right? Uh, and looking back now at that chaos of a time, I remember one of our earliest champions was a neighbor named Sarah Bott. And Sarah was one of those neighbors that knew everybody, you know what I mean? Like just super connected, really involved in the community, like a real world changer. And she started talking us up like we were for real or something, you know? <laughs> Which, I mean, we were, but we weren't, you know? I mean, you know the story up to this point. All I had was, like, now, like, late fees at the library. That's, you know, that was it. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, all these people started coming along and saying, hey, I heard about what you're doing. How can we help? And it was like, oh, this is amazing. And so we kind of started moving forward, but then we needed money, uh, uh, a lot of money. We had nothing. We had no grants. We had very few donations, and all of those went towards our first and last month's rent. And so now what do we do? Uh, and we, at that same time, got a letter from the IRS informing us that we were, have been approved as a nonprofit, but we have been rejected for tax exempt status because of our model. So that mean, meant we had to raise a significant amount of money without being able to give anybody a tax write off. What do we do? Again, we looked to the pint glass. And we came up with what we call our founders. We have uh, three levels of founders, to be precise. Each gave a specific amount of money, and in return, they received either a free beer a month, one free beer a week, or one free beer every day for life. <laughs> Served in their own personalized pint glass, with their name etched right in it, celebrated each time they come in like norm, you know, just like, <laughs> yeah. And recently I was told that this was called uh, crowdsourcing, right? I, we had no idea what that was. You know. For us, this was just a, a way of just trying to keep this idea and this dream alive, just sharing it with everyone we met. And what was amazing and what I discovered was as dozens of people started donating their hard-earned money towards this dream, I realized this was the strongest resource that we had. Not the beer, but <laughs> close. The community. The people of Portland, our neighborhood, Woodlawn, they were as excited about this idea as we were. And Saturday mornings, if we had any money, we would buy material and we would meet together in the pub and we would build and work and paint and sand and clean and do everything. And it was absolutely fascinating to see people coming together and partnering with us in this thing. I remember I have this memory of like Tuesday morning, I was working in the pub by myself uh, because everybody had a real job, right? And so I was in there, and I see the silhouette in the doorway out of the corner of my eye, and I look over, and in one hand he has a toolbox, and in the other it has like a mason jar of home-brewed kombucha. And I was like, Portland personified has come to save us. Uh, and uh, he said, hey, I read about what you're doing, I'm, I'm here, what can I do? And I was just like, mind blown. You know, like, what? This is incredible to see this community partnering together in this way. Hundreds and hundreds of people came out over the years to donate their time and make their mark on Portland's pub, because that's really what we are. We're Portland's pub. We have no owner. We have no investors, no shareholders. Nobody makes a dime off of this, except for the community, which is really exciting for us. Yeah. And we needed all the help we could get. Uh, we had a lot of work ahead of us. I remember early on we had, there was this big fan in the back of the kitchen area of the pub uh, on the wall and we were cleaning and so we removed the fan to clean it and um, we pu pulled it off the wall and behind it was just like another wall. This was the only ventilation in the entire restaurant that we took over. And we were like, what? So this fan, which was meant to exhaust the grease and the grime and the stink, was just instead of agitating it and like redistributing it evenly across the entire ceiling of our pub. And if you touched it, there was like a half inch layer of grease on the entire ceiling. If you touched it, your fingers sunk in. 
And so, so we had a mop and ladder party. We called our whole network and group of community of people, and, and everybody came out. And uh, they all, we literally mopped the entire ceiling of the pub. And it was awesome. We were laughing and cringing the whole way as drops of grossness would fall on us. And I was like, ah. But it was like an old fashioned barn raising, you know? Like everybody involved, everybody had a part to play. Everybody was just as valuable as the first or the last. Um, and it was really fun and incredible. But imagine a barn raising where after like two years, of working every week, the barn ain't up yet. <laughs> like, there's no place to put the livestock, right? Uh, at some point, it gets discouraging. Um, picture receiving $2,500 from someone for the exchange of a free beer a day for life. And they're just looking at you like almost three years later, like thirsty, <laughs> <You know? laughs> like waiting for their beer, you know? And we're just like, sorry, you know. There's nothing we could do about it. I mean, we, we didn't, it wasn't like a rabbit we could pull out of our head and be like, okay, we've been holding on to this, and now we're ready. We, we, we were making this up as we went. Nobody had opened a restaurant in this fashion before, um, and it was really hard at times. A lot of us, a lot of, if you know our story, a lot of you thought maybe this isn't going to happen. Uh, and looking back now at those hard times of you know, discouragement, what's interesting is uh, all I remember is being encouraged. You know, something bad would happen. We'd, we'd hit a roadblock. We'd get a phone call from, like, the plumber or electrician, and it would sound like the whole thing was closed, like it's never going to happen. And, but out of nowhere, some form of encouragement would come in. And always, always, it was always people. It was always the community rallying together. I remember close to the end, uh, we, the pub was done. You walked in there and you thought, dang, this place is ready. I'm going to place my order now. Like, we're ready to go. It looked amazing until you walked into the kitchen or the vacuous empty space that was supposed to be a kitchen one day. And we had nothing in there. And finally, we got the funds together to purchase our cooking range, this $25,000 beauty that we had been drooling over for literally two years, anticipating, preparing for it. And I got the call from the driver, the delivery guy, and he said, hey, I'm here with it. And I was like, so excited, I literally ran up there. I live just a few blocks from the pub. And so I ran up there to open the door for him. And he opens the truck and he pulls out this mammoth like Volkswagen sized piece of stainless steel and iron and BTUs and, and he has it on this giant pallet jack and I remember thinking I, I hope he can roll that all the way to the kitchen because there's no way we're moving it once it gets set down you know and I open the door and we go to put it in and it doesn't fit <laughs> I saw that one coming you see, in the two years since we had been planning and preparing to purchase this exact unit, this like serial number and everything, we had piped and, and uh, plumbed and wired and got everything ready for this exact thing, we had changed the windows and the doors, and the new doors were four inches smaller, and now it didn't fit. And I remember the driver, uh, he looked at the door, and he looked at the cooking range, and he looked at me and he said, well, see you later. <laughs> and he just... <laughs> I just drove away. And I was like, what? And then it started snowing. <laughs> and I'm standing there as I see little white flakes of wet snow falling on the most expensive piece of machinery we had ever purchased. And it, on my cheeks, hiding my tears. And I'm just like stuck. You know, I had no tools. I had no car. I had no way to like leave it on the sidewalk. Like, yeah, I'll figure it out later, you know? <laughs> so I just get on my phone and I call everybody I could think of. And literally within minutes, uh, I see Ed pull up in his truck, and I see Stephen uh, walking up the street with uh, his, his crescent wrench, and together we disassemble this unit on the sidewalk, promising to each other we would remember where every nut and bolt <laughs> and screw went. We slid it in there, put it back together, and it still hasn't blown up on us, so I think that's a win. <laughs> but as of to uh, May of 2013, uh, the Oregon Public House finally opened its doors. The same doors that were too small to fit the cooking range, uh, but large enough to welcome families and kids and friends and neighbors and storytellers and musicians and world changers and hipsters. Anybody who thinks that the idea of going out and giving back is an idea worth checking out. 
And in less than a year, um, our first year, the hardest year of operation, we've been able to donate almost $25,000 to local charities. Which, yeah. Organizations that, uh, you know, plant trees, mentor kids at risk, uh, provide microloans in Nicaragua, um, build homes for the needy, and dozens of other world-changing organizations. And here's how it works. It's really simple. You walk in and you place your order. You choose what you'd like to eat, what you'd like to drink, and where you want your individual profits to go to, whatever cause you feel deepest and most passionate about. And at the end of the month, we reconcile our books, and 100% of our net profit is donated how our customers chose. Our vision is very simple. We exist to eat in community, to drink to a new way of giving back, and to give to those that are changing the world. And it has been an absolute amazing adventure over the last four years to see this thing happen. Community formed around this basic idea that we could have a pint and change the world. Cheers. Wow.